Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, you'll have an opportunity for a question and answer session. To ask questions at that time, please press star, then one, and record your name when prompted. Also, this call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your first speaker, Ms. Madeline Ransom. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Economics of Poor Grazing Management. Kevin Ogle is a grazing land specialist, and I, Madeline Ransom, are presenting today. And we're really glad to have Michael Hall in the room with us so he can participate as well. One of the things we want to start with is the walk away message that we would like you to have. The main point, or the walk away message, is that the economics of poor grazing management is the study of choice with consequences. There are many definitions of economics. You've heard some of them, I'm sure. One is something like, well, it's the optimal allocation of limited resources to unlimited wants and desires. And that's certainly still consistent with the idea of choice with consequence that we always are making a choice. In fact, we made a choice today about joining this webinar. We're, I think we're having a bit of a technical difficulty. Okay, great, thank you. So, poor grazing is a choice. And in fact, it might actually be profitable. Good grazing practices can be more profitable and excellent grazing practices could be most profitable. What's important to me as an economist is for us to be sensitive to the possibility that although poor grazing is a dreadful disaster for the ecosystem, it might actually have some profits and therefore create an inertia to change. Our session today has three sections. The first one is the economics and how it relates to grazing. The second is fundamental grazing concepts for the economics that Kevin is going to present. And the third, Kevin and I will do together, and maybe Michael will join in, a cow-calf example. The example that we have has a basis in a Virginia case study. And we are really grateful to our Virginia colleagues, J.B. Daniels, the grazing land specialist, and David Faulkner, the state economist. Their case study was extremely interesting. We made modifications in that case study for a couple of reasons, all related to this webinar. That case study was pretty complicated, and so we simplified, and then some of the data we changed to make it a bit more general so that the data itself wouldn't be in the way of the message of the economics. So, Consequence of Choice. Here are two books that are actually in my library that I have found really helpful to me as an applied economist working with decision makers. And that's really what we're doing when we provide technical assistance. We're working with decision makers. One is called Choice and Consequence by Thomas Schelling, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist. And that's exactly what he's talking about, that every choice is made among a set of alternatives and that every choice has advantages and disadvantages. And essentially, sometimes when decision makers are stuck, I ask them what negative consequences they're most willing to live with, because every alternative has downsides. The second is knowledge and decisions, which is really what we are about as an agency, isn't it, as we're doing our field work, that creating and disseminating the knowledge for the decision makers so that their decisions are based more on knowledge than they were before. So suppose we said that there were three grazing alternatives. We'll name them poor, good, and excellent. So poor is continuous grazing, 50% ground cover, animals have eaten all the good stuff. Good is some rotation, 75% ground cover with grass only. And excellent is 95% ground cover with grass and litter and clover in a diverse mixture. 
So we have these three alternatives. How are we going to evaluate them? Well, you ask what are the costs of each alternative? What are the benefits of each alternative? And what are the landowner goals? One of the things economists recognized oh so long ago who were doing applied work, they would come up with these optimal solutions, you know, this optimal land use pattern and this optimal feeding mix and this optimal crop pattern stuffing. And they look and not see too many people doing this optimal implementation and asking why. There are many reasons why, and one reason that they speculated about was called satisficing, that decision makers are satisfied with what they're doing. They're not maximizing. What they're doing is just bumping along in some kind of comfortable zone, and they're satisfied. So the landowner, if the landowner's goal is to just kind of keep doing the same thing, then it becomes really important, I think, to understand that and to help them open some doors of possibilities, what are alternatives. When they are satisfied, one of the things I notice that seems to work really well is engaging them in identifying alternatives. So they're becoming active in that process. Engaging them to answer questions, what are the costs and what are the benefits? so that they are opening these doors to what's possible. So to introduce cost and benefit thinking, we're going to use now some hypothetical numbers in very simple comparison. And later, we'll provide a more detailed example based on the Virginia reality. So suppose the economist came to you with these numbers. This is for the poor alternative. So you have here the price per pound for the animal sold at a dollar. The average weight, 550 pounds. So therefore, the total revenue per animal is $550. And suppose the cost was estimated to be 95 cents a pound, and the cost per animal, 522, and now we have the difference between revenue and cost being 27.50. For this very simple example, benefit is the gross revenue from the animal sale. The cost was obvious. And the net benefit is the ben benefit minus the cost. And what we notice out of these hypothetical numbers is even though it's a poor grazing, we are making some profit. The takeaway message is poor grazing does not necessarily mean negative profit. So the economist comes and gives you some numbers for the alternative we named good. Well, we're still getting the same price per animal, sorry, per pound. But look at the animal weight went up, skipping over to the cost column. The average cost went down some, and the profit actually increased from 27 to 39. And the walk away is that the poor grazing, so let's assume that they're currently doing poor grazing, and what they see is 27.50, but in fact they're losing, and what they're losing is the 39.20 minus the 27.50, or $11.70 an animal. The economist comes back and gives you now some data for excellence. Still getting the same price per pound, but now the weight has increased, skipping over to the cost column, the cost has decreased, and now the profits have increased to $90. The walkaway message here is although excellent grazing may be expensive to install with the fencing and the watering facility, it may actually be the most profitable alternative when one looks at an average annual value. So, what are the lost profits when we compare poor with excellent? Before, we compared poor with good. And now, what do we see? That the lost profit is $90 minus the $27.50. So now, it's losing $62.50 per animal. The important point of this hypothetical example is perspective. 
The poor grazing can be seen as profitable when viewed as a simple calculation of cost and benefit of the poor grazing operation. Just in and of itself, it's standing in a place where they can cover their costs and have some money left over. However, poor grazing can be a loser when viewed another way, and that is comparing the profits among the alternative grazing operations. There are two questions that Kevin and I would like you to keep in mind as we're going to turn this over to Kevin. Why might the animal weight increase simply because of the rotation of grazing? And why might the cost per animal decrease because of rotational grazing? And so now, Kevin, would you like to tell us about some grazing concepts? Sure. Our grazing management is based on a forage animal balance. And I know many of you will know this, but uh, some people may not, so we're just going to lay a foundation here. If we have supply and demand uh, as equals, then we have a balance. So we could say that if supply equals demand, that would equal one. When we talk about a forage animal balance in a grazing system, we're talking about the pasture supply and the animal demand. So we hope that they're in balance, and we'll see later on it's even better if we can have higher pasture supply than animal demand. But what happens if we have more animal demand than we have pasture supply, then we end up with a number that's less than one in our balance. So managed grazing balances the animal's demand with the forage supply. And to do that, we have to determine the forage supply or the pasture, and we have to determine the animal demand. And then we simply uh, need to either increase forage supply or decrease animal demand in order to put it back in balance. So the forage animal balance of pasture is determined by four factors, uh, pasture supply, which is the yearly forage production in pounds times the seasonal utilization rate. And then we divide that by the animal demand, which is the herd intake per day times the length of the grazing season in days. We can also use this equation to, to find out some information that we'd like to know. For instance, we could solve for the, the utilization rate. What would be uh, the utilization rate we need to be back in balance? That's how one way we could do it. Another way is to, to solve for the herd intake per day. Uh, that might tell us what the amount of animals we can have in our current condition on that pasture. First, let's look at yearly forage production. That's simply the annual yield in pounds per acre times the total pasture acres. Then we're going to take our yearly forage production times the seasonal utilization rate. Well, what do we mean by this utilization rate? If we have uh, one large pasture, we call that continuous grazing. We actually get that effect even if we have two or three pastures where the animals are grazing for more than uh, 10 or 12 days in the same pasture. Our utilization rate is only about 30%. So those animals have a very large pasture. They can be very selective over what they eat. And some plants they will never get to, and then they will grow and become large and less palatable and less digestible. So the animals will avoid them, but they'll go back to the tender plants. And we'll see um, as we go on here some examples of that. So as the number of pastures increase, uh, the size of the paddocks usually will get smaller. And as they get smaller, the animal's utilization of the forage in those paddocks increases. And as the number of days in the grazing period gets smaller, the days of rest for all the paddocks will increase. That's real important. So just wanted to show you an example. We've shown this before already. Uh, here's a continuously grazed pasture. So we would call that about 30% utilization. You can see some tall plants in the background that are not being eaten. Why is that? Well, we look at this yield quality persistence compromise. Um, we take a look here at the small plants on the left of the screen. Those are very 
uh, young and tender, very palatable, so the intake is high. The animals have no problem wanting to eat those, and the digestibility is, is very high also. The most, uh, but, but when the plants grow and mature, uh, they eventually will get to the point where they have, have very little uh, digestibility. The intake is very low, therefore, by the animal. However, our yield, our quantity of the forage is at its highest point. So what we try to do is reach this compromise where those things cross in the middle. We try to get as much yield as we can, but still be digestible enough that, so that intake is high and so that we don't damage the plants uh, at uh, the time that we're going to stop grazing so that those plants can regrow quickly. So the reason the grazing period, rest period, and the plant heights at which we begin and end grazing is so important is so that we will have healthy, vigorous plants able to give us the maximum production for the feed for these cattle. Uh, just a picture of cool season grasses and lagoons, kind of some standard beginning grazing heights depending on the plant species, 6 to 12 inches, and then take them out and, and make sure they stop grazing at the 3 to 4 inch height. If we graze more than 50% of the leaves of the plant, we can actually stop root growth. This is very damaging to the plant and that we will actually, uh, in continuous grazing situations, when certain species of plants are eaten repeatedly, maybe three or four times during a month, that we can actually kill that plant because it can no longer recover. So how does managed grazing keep plants strong? Well, they leave a taller, residual plant with longer rest, <coughs> excuse me, longer rest periods. That means we're going to have more roots, so that helps the plant withstand droughts better. It can reach down for that water throughout the soil. It can also reach down deeper into the soil for nutrients, for minerals. Okay, now we're going to uh, take a little look and, and relate these things. Uh, here, continuous grazing. One of the plants that got eaten off very often uh, would be like the, the far left uh, piece of sod there in the picture. So that would be our 30% utilization rate. Then a three to five day grazing period or 50% utilization rate would be more like the, the piece of sod uh, third to the right there. And then a grazing period of just a half day to two days could be as high as a 70% utilization rate and that would probably represent our fourth piece of sod to the right. In our cow-calf operation, uh, we're talking about a two to five day grazing period uh, alternative that you'll see in our case study that the, the livestock manager chose with uh, seven, eight, or nine paddocks, could have all the way up to 16 paddocks, and this would probably be more like the third piece of sod to the right. Manure distribution. Now here's another benefit of grazing management is that we want to be able to return as much of the nutrients that the animals eat through the forage back to that pasture. In a two to five day grazing period, like we mentioned for a cow-calf operation, uh, University of Missouri did some research that showed that it take about two years to get one cow pie per square yard. You could see by moving the animals once a day we could actually get one pie per square yard in one grazing season. Here's maybe a better visually way to, to see that. Here's one paddock at the top in a three pasture rotation, so that's much like continuous grazing. Much of that pasture is getting very little nutrients returned to it, only 10 to 20 cow pies per 500 square feet. But the uh, one at the bottom, one paddock of a 24 paddock rotation, we can see lots of nutrients getting returned back to that pasture. Much of the pasture getting 40, 50, 60 cow pies per 500 square feet. So this is really important when we want to return nutrients back to the soil. We know that since 75 to 90 percent of the nutrients that the cattle are eating are being deposited back as urine and manure, uh, that's a big important point when we talk about fertility of the pasture. 
Here's a study that was done. Three inches of rain in 90 minutes on a 10% slope. Excellent pasture, 95% ground cover. We only had a little over 10% runoff. On the fair pasture with 75% ground cover, we had about 50% runoff. and We even lost a few pounds of soil. Then look at the poor pasture. 50% ground cover, over 70% runoff, and over four tons per acre of soil loss. So it's really important uh, to be able to manage that grass. Litter is very important in moisture management. So if we use excellent grazing management, we can have some litter left. Litter is simply the plant parts that have senesced or died from the previous grazing. So there could be old stems, leaves, and those lay on the soil surface. They, they feed the microbial community. They also provide some insulation and we'll see in a minute how that's important. But it also uh, helps with infiltration. So we can see that the excellent pasture here was able to absorb over two inches per hour of a rainfall event versus the continuous graze where you'd have very little uh, leaves or stems left over from a previous grazing. Uh, they can only absorb about one inch per hour of a rain event. Here's a better way to see that visually. Here's a packed picture that uh, J.B. Daniel gave me, continuous grazing. <coughs> Excuse me, lots of runoff <coughs> in uh, that, those first jugs to the front, and uh, the infiltration jugs are underneath. So very little infiltration, lots of runoff, which our dad already showed us, good rotational, very little runoff, lots of infiltration, excellent rotational, the runoff is actually a little clearer, there's very little of it, but the infiltration, there's not quite as much as a good rotational, and that's because that water is still being held in those few inches of, of soil in the tray, thanks to roots and the microbial community, those kinds of things. So it's real important. Another benefit to good grazing management is that we're able to keep the soil temperatures down to keep those soil microbes alive and to retain the moisture that we have got. We want to be able to hold that moisture for a later time in the year when the plants need it. So here on a very hot day is a temperature reading taking one inch beneath, beneath the soil in a continuously grazed pasture. You can see some, some bare soil throughout here in this continuously grazed pasture. Over 113 degrees uh, soil temperature. So a lot of things are suffering in that situation. Same day, uh, not very far away in a well-managed pasture, 27 degrees cooler, a little over 86 degrees. That, that's really holding a lot more moisture than the continuously grazed pasture. Now we're going to talk about animal demand real quick, what determines animal demand, animal intake time spent grazing, biting rate, bite size, we won't go into those details, but we just want to show you uh, that we need to be able to figure the intake per day for the herd, take that times the length of the grazing season in days, and typically it's recommended to use about 3% of body weight for a beef lactating cow, so that's what we'll use. And you might want to write this down if you want to do a little math. Our continuous grazing operation, we said 30% utilization. We got 22 beef cows weighing 1,100 pounds each, one bull weighing 1,500 pounds. We got about 70 acres of pasture, and we're going to be very kind and say that that uh, has about 6,500 pounds per acre yield and a 210 day grazing season. Okay, so we simply figure out the forage yearly production. Here we get 455,000 pounds times our utilization rate. We said it's 30%, so we end up with 136.5. Then we're going to do the animal demand. Okay, pounds of intake, body weight per day, times the number of head. Well, that's going to be about 33 pounds times 22 cows. Can't forget the bull. Um, he's out there, too, eating. So uh, we had to add 45 pounds for him, so we get 771 pounds, and we have the length of the grazing season, which is 210 days, so we have 161,910, and 
We simply put that into our equation and we get 0.84. So we're less than one. We are out of balance. So things are uh, not good. We probably are gonna see some resources damaged like our picture. And uh, most people can recognize when animals are starting to go hungry or, or starve. And so what happens? They don't let that happen. They have to help the supply. Remember I said we had to increase pasture supply? They do that by feeding hay. And that has a cost. Uh, whether you're buying hay or making your own hay, there's, there's uh, making your own hay, there's cost of fuel, labor, but there's also the labor to feed it to those animals. And uh, there would be times of the year where that would have to be happening quite often. So. There's, uh, it's really important to realize that uh, there's a reason why we have a forage animal balance and we want to make sure that, that we can have that. Okay, uh, now I'm going to turn it back to uh, Madeline and we'll talk about our case study example. Great, thank you very much, Kevin. We're going to start at the end. The end is what are the benefits and what are the costs and what are the net benefits. So we thought we'd start at the end so you get a sense of the neighborhood of values here. So we have a summary of benefits and costs for the whole farm operation from excellent rotational grazing. And we're expressing those values in average annual. And I'll explain in just a minute what that means. But just to get a sense of numbers, the additional benefits are about $11,600 on an average annual basis. The additional costs are $3,300. What does additional mean? What it means is these are the additional benefits due to the excellent rotational grazing. These are not the benefits from the whole farm if we were just to walk in and kind of start counting stuff. This is just looking at the changes that occur because of the rotational grazing. So when you subtract 3,000 from almost 12,000, you get about $8,000 net benefit. So let's start breaking this down a little bit. So where are, what are those additional benefits? So we'll look at a summary of the additional benefits. There were two kinds of benefits. One was the cost savings and the other was the higher revenues. The cost savings were about 4,500 on an average annual basis. The higher revenues were 7,000 on an average annual basis. That was a very curious number to Kevin and me and Michael. And we'll be talking more about that when we drill down into these numbers. Going back to the big summary table of the additional benefits and the additional costs, let's look at what the additional costs were. And these will not surprise you. We have additional fencing because we're going to make smaller paddocks, additional watering facilities, and in this case the animals have been in the streams and near some springs and now they've been fenced out of that so they still need water. Additional livestock, curious, and we'll be talking a lot about that, and pasture improvement. So when we bring all this together, we look at the cost and the question is, well, is that too costly? Well, for me as an economist, that's just not really the question yet. I can't tell if that's too costly or not. It depends. Well, you look at the benefits, say, well, look at those benefits. That's what you get out of spending $3,000. So for an economist, it's not enough to look just at the benefits or just at the cost. You need to look at both of them together in order to get the bottom line. Well, how big is that bottom line? So when Kevin and I were sharing this with Michael, he looked at that $8,000, like, well, that's ridiculous. And it was hard to communicate that, you know what, this is for the whole operation. This is, this is the 65 acres, this is the 28 animals that they sold. So after talking with Michael, I went back and said, well, let's take the $8,000 and divide it by the 65 acres, and on a per acre basis, it's about $130 increase 
uh, average annual due to the excellent rotational grazing. If I were to take those net benefits and divide them by the 28 animals that are sold, I get about $300 per animal as the increase due to the excellent rotational grazing. So the thing I'd like to communicate here about this is when you look at a number, if, if the underlying numbers made sense, then it surely the summary number has to make some kind of sense. And so it's sometimes really useful to express that same information in different ways just to get a sense of what that number is trying to tell you in terms of the economic story. So before we go any further, let's talk about average annual values. They're one way of looking at costs and benefits, and we can talk about this in future sessions, more about kinds of values that you would use to look at the various parts of that decision process. And let's do something that I think is pretty darn simple we've all experienced, and that is buying a vehicle. And in this case, we're going to purchase a truck for $54,000. And let's say we don't have savings and we can't write the check. So we're going to buy this truck, but by golly, we're going to take a loan. And that loan has a duration, let's say five years, and an interest rate, let's say 9%. And what that loan agreement does is take that $54,000, the five years of the 9%, amortizes that 54 to produce the monthly payment. And we've all experienced that. So when we are amortizing a lump, whether it's a lump of benefits or a lump of cost, we are taking that lump and we're distributing it over time such that in each time interval that value is going to be the same. So when we amortize the truck, every month you're writing the check or we're doing a transfer for the same amount. So that's part of the average annual. Now we got the truck, by golly we're going to operate the truck. So there are lots of different operations operating costs, we're going to just look at gas to be simple. So $4 a gallon. All right, so that's what we're estimating it to be. So this little cloudy image there, that's meant to communicate, well, we don't know for sure what the operating costs are going to be. Maybe we're approximating of 15 miles to the gallon. Well, that can change going uphill, a heavy load, um, jackrabbit starts on a green light. That can change. And we approximate, well, we drive about 150 miles in a week. Well, of course, that can change. Yet, we can still come up with an estimate of monthly expenses. So now, what do we have in average annual value? We've got the monthly payment, the amortized value of the lump, plus those costs that really do occur on a monthly basis and add those two together, and in this case, we get a monthly cost. Well, we have a January cost and a February cost and the rest of the year cost, and add all that together, and we have an average annual cost. So an average annual value, whether it's the cost or the benefit, is an amortized lump value plus the flow values, such as fuel. So now, let's drill down and look at some numbers. One of the things that Kevin and I did with Michael was create an Excel workbook for you, and it will be available to you. And what we did was show ourselves in detail how we use the Virginia case study for this webinar. What you see on the screen right now is one part of that worksheet. And some of this looks kind of familiar. But let's start at the top here, the partial budgeting. So again, I'm emphasizing these are the costs and the benefits due to the excellent rotational grazing. So we're not looking at all costs and all benefits of a livestock operation. So one of the additional costs was fencing. And what you see here as the column titles, unit, you all have seen this, and unit cost, and the number of units, and then the total cost, and then the conversion of total cost to average annual cost. 
And if we look at the first one in this table, we'll see that that was an electric fence, which is a lump cost. You're going to only buy that once in some time period. And so here's the lump cost. In this case, it's not that expensive of $150. But it is a lump that's going to only occur once in some time period. And when you specify the time period, and we did a 10-year time period, uh, Virginia did 30 years. So we used a 10-year time period at interest rate of about 6%, and we got this average annual. So when it's a lump, the total is different from the average annual. But when it's a flow variable, so that you have here the O and M, the O and M is occurring on an annual basis, and so the total cost is already an annual value. So in this case, the total cost equals the average. The reason you want to be converting total, making sure the total can be expressed as average annual, is so that you can add up all the like numbers. And in this case, we had about $500 as an average annual cost. So for the rest of the presentation, we are only going to present two of these columns to you. You'll have Excel. You can play with it. You can talk to us about it, make changes. But for the presentation, we don't need to talk about this center anymore for the goal we have. So if we were to take that same table and hide the columns, we'll have only two columns left. And this is what we're going to do for the rest of the presentation. So, do you want to talk about the water ring? Right. Uh, just like we talked about, uh, you know, all these things happen as a, as a cost anytime we make a change. So, we talked about fence just now. The, the livestock manager had to add fence in order to go to this different kind of grazing system. They also had to uh, provide some water. We talked about how one of the changes they made was fencing out from the stream and, and uh, some of the springs. So they added, I think, two concrete uh, watering tanks. And so there was a cost to doing that. And there's also a cost to do some of the maintenance to that. So in order to, to get that, we have an average annual cost here of $184. Okay. See, what other costs did we have? Ooh. Additional livestock. This this was very weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we don't, as grazing specialists, I know some of you grazing specialists listening, uh, you know, we never say, well, why don't you go out and increase your herd by 50% <laughs> uh, by changing to some managed grazing. We, we don't want to suggest that ever. Uh, we would normally want somebody to, to get used to managing the grass, get used to managing the animals before they make any kind of a change. But here was a situation, and uh, Madeline will talk to you a little bit about them before, but in the after situation, the livestock manager noticed some positive changes in the quality of forage and the quantity of forage for all the reasons we discussed earlier. And so therefore they felt that they could actually add some additional animals, and uh, we'll show you here in a little while. Uh, we we actually figured the forage animal balance based on the real numbers that this livestock manager used. So after five years of, of seeing that, they felt that they could purchase more animals and uh, be able to handle them. And in fact, they increased the herd by 50 percent. Right? They did. Uh, the other thing that happened, th this was also very interesting, was uh, they added a bull. And uh, the it was a more expensive bull, uh, not the type of bull that they would used before. And uh, we had quite a discussion about that, uh, Michael, Madeline, and I, uh, about, you know, just because somebody adds a bull, that doesn't necessarily, you know, that's not automatic with changing the managed grazing. But, and, and we realized that uh, someone could add a, a better genetic bull, which would probably be more expensive to a poor grazing 
operation and would probably see some results in increased weaning weights uh, and some things. But uh, Madeline, talk about those beginning years. Yes, yeah, so the data that we got from Virginia indicated that before they went to the excellent rotational grazing, they had 16 years of experience. And so as Michael and Kevin were talking about this more expensive and higher genetic value bull, it's like, well, you know, they're going to get impacts because of the bull, and that's right. But why did they get the bull? And as an economist, I am linking the changes we observe to the rotational grazing or not. And what we had was 16 years of evidence that this operator did not buy the expensive bull. But then after noticing the difference in productivity off the pasture, said, you know what, I could get even a higher bump. So it was that kind of thinking that said, you bet, that additional cost to the bull is going to be part of the cost of that rotational grazing. Because without, our evidence was without the rotational grazing, you would have used the same old bull. Sorry. <laughs> that, that, that's great. That's great. Uh, one of the things we wanted to point out, too, is, is that uh, we saw some differences by having better forage quality and quantity that the cows were healthier. Leader. Oh, okay. okay so we're, we're still on cost. Okay? okay, that's right. We're still on cost. <laughs> uh, we, but we wanted to point out that, that uh, you know, when you have more cows, there's, there's more costs involved. So costs did go up. Uh, the replacement cost. Replacement and cost. And then the vet bill. Right. Okay. So that was pretty surprising to us. So the last one that we considered was pasture improvement. And go ahead and talk about that. Uh, of course, the, here's some things that, that uh, people would do um, regardless of, of their kind of pasture management with some people will soil test and lime and fertilize according to that soil test according to our land grant university in our state. So those are costs that, that would happen. Um, also, the decision was made, and, and this is again due to the management changes and those in grazing heights, observing those, instead of grazing things all the way to the ground, that uh, due to the suggestion of, of the planner, with this livestock manager, they added clover to the mix, and there was a cost to that for for the seed and and uh, spreading that broadcasting that seed out. And when I look at those costs for pasture improvement, the one that really sticks out is the fertilizer cost, and that's something to keep in mind when we later look at benefits. So summary of the additional costs: the same thing, the watering facilities the additional livestock due to the increased productivity of the pasture and the pasture improvement. And now on to the benefits. By golly, remember there were two categories of benefits. One was cost savings, and this is what we're seeing here. The first one on this list is reduction in labor to handle the animals. And it went from four hours per week down to one hour per week for every one of those 52 weeks. and that I use $12 an hour, somewhat skilled labor to handle the animals, and that included things such as delivering and managing the hay. And that savings on an average annual basis was almost $2,000 a year for the whole operation. Uh, another uh, benefit that we saw, uh, this, was, this was Virginia, so there's lots of in the fight infected tall fescue, but with the additional clover, uh, there was that dilution effect, and also because of, of sticking to those uh, residual grazing heights that we want to leave when the animals leave a paddock and a longer rest period, we begin to see some diversity uh, enter those pastures also, and so therefore uh, the endophyte risk was lessened. Uh, another big improvement was we talked about fencing out of the streams and those springs that they had uh, constant access to. Uh, with the new system, they saw uh, lower foot rot and pink eye problems 
uh, the cost of fencing them out uh, of that water. And so the cost savings was the veterinary visit. Another one was reduced mowing. So when we think of the graphic that Kevin shared with us with the growth of the, the plant, yeah, because you had this optimal grazing, then you didn't have that many plants that needed to be mowed, so there was a reduction in the mowing cost. Uh, another uh, thing we wanted to talk about here, uh, I was getting ahead of myself earlier, the fertilizer and the lime reduction. Uh, remember the, the slide I showed about the uh, manure distribution, how important that is, putting that natural fertility back uh, that those animals deposit on the pasture. You remember the, the continuously grazed three paddock system uh, we saw there. Uh, it was not very evenly distributed, but going to this uh, seven or eight paddock system like this livestock manager did, uh, there wasn't a need to uh, apply as much fertilizer on those fields. And then when we had looked at that cost and how important fertilizer cost was to the total cost, you can see why that savings is so significant. The last two are related. Before this ex excellent rotational grazing, this operator was renting, in fact, he was renting 20 acres. And in order to get the animals to those 20 acres, he had to transport them. And so now that he had more productive fields, he actually went from 85 acres down to 65 acres, saving rent on 20 acres and saving the transportation costs of getting the animals to and fro. So we look at the lower cost, and you see the two big ones were the change in labor and the change in fertilizer and lime. The other additional benefits had to do with the higher revenues. And so hopefully you understand that this is an operation that added cows. In fact, they added uh, 10 cows. And so you had the revenue from the calves of those 10 cows. You also had a higher survival rate to weaning because the animals were healthier. So because of those, uh, those additional cows had calves that were living uh, toward after weaning or up to weaning. And then the second higher revenue was due to the original calves who now have a higher weight gain. So the weight gain went from approximately, I can't remember now, was it 500 to 600? 500 it, was, it was substantial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So we had those additional opportunities to earn money in the market. In summary of the additional benefits, they were coming from lower cost and from higher revenues. Bringing it all together again, it's always about the cost and the benefit and the difference between the two. So earlier we asked you to consider two questions. One was, why might the cost per animal decrease when you increase the quality of the pasture? Well, for the case study we looked at, it showed the following cost savings. One was the reduced animal handling labor, reduced vet bills, reduced mowing, reduced lime and fertilizer. The land rental was no longer necessary, so you saved that money, and you saved, you eliminated the livestock transportation costs. So why might the animal weight increase? Yes, when, when uh this person started, and, and you know, those of you that, that know about uh, beef cattle operations and weaning weight, you know, under the poor grazing management, of course, there was a lot of hay being fed. Uh, that's not a bad number. But with the better quality and quantity of pasture, uh, look at the difference. And, and these are the livestock manager's numbers. These aren't numbers we made up. Uh, the increase went to 600 pounds. Uh, for that that calf, so that was significant that he was able to do that just from the difference in grazing management. Oh, and we also we also talked about uh, fewer calves lost because of healthier cow, cows, and also 
Uh, I talked earlier about the reduced endophyte risk from adding that clover and the reduced foot rot and pink eye due to being out of those wet areas. So our hope is that from our presentation today, you might have a sense of why when you increase the quality of the pasture, you could actually increase the animal weight and you could decrease the cost per animal. Okay, so we put those real numbers back into our equation, the production on those pastures, and our utilization rate went up. Uh, it's now 50%, if you, if you remember that uh, uh, utilization rate I showed on a two to five day grazing period, which this person was going to use, uh, did use. And I also increased the pounds per day that the herd needed, because we now have uh, 33, I think, uh -huh. uh, cows in the herd plus the bull and uh, the 210 days stayed the same so now we have one we, we're in balance so life's good no problems we don't have to worry about anything else no that that's not true um, we see this yellow dotted line which represents cow calf demand typical operation and the green line is the typical cool season yield distribution or growth, and the blue line is the red and white clover, um, typical distribution and growth. And so uh, we have a time in here, uh, usually late summer, especially in the Mid-South and, and uh, the Southeast, where we are gonna have to feed hay. We, just from cool season grasses and lagoons alone, we're not able to uh, provide that just by pasture. Now, uh, we're going to talk about, in hopefully, in our future series, uh, what are some things we can do to mitigate that. But in this real-life situation, uh, this is what this farmer faced. Um, however, the, they definitely noticed a great reduction in the amount of hay that they had to feed under the old system. So it was still positive. So... Kevin just indicated that he and I are interested in doing a series. This came out of the challenge we faced of giving you something useful in only one hour. It's a really large topic. And so we are interested in providing a series of short webinars to address more specific economics and grazing topics. And so we'll be sending out ideas that we have, and we are really asking you to contact us with your ideas of grazing economics series. What things can we do to help you do your work better? Uh, Matt, if you're there, I think we're ready for uh, questions. If there are any questions or comments at this time, please press star, then one, and record your name when prompted. Also, please make sure that your mute button is turned off. Once again, for any questions or comments, press star, then one, and record your name when prompted. Okay, Madeline, I, I've got a question here. Did the breakdown to net profit per acre of pasture, uh, did they break down? Uh, the net profit per acre of pasture in this study. Did Virginia? Yeah, no, uh, I know. You know, <laughs> it's been so long since I read that. And David Faulkner, I wonder if he's on from Virginia. David Faulkner, are you on? J.B. Daniel, are you on? Uh, but let's let's back up and ask what what the oh gosh I wish this was a conversation what what are you really getting at with that question what is your concern so I tell you what why don't you contact us and we'll address that more fully yeah and you and you can ask questions through your phone by by following what our conference leader uh, told you we do have a question that came in thank you Rob Weaver your line is open. Hey, Kevin, this is Rob. Um, I asked that question because in order, like here in Lancaster County, the pastures are so small and we want to convert it over. If we want to bring in cropland in, they look at their cropland based upon net profit that they're getting for the corn, tobacco, or whatever they're growing. And that's why I was asking that. 
so that way they can look at it in that term since you were portraying it as net per cow um, just twisting it around doing net per acre so they can compare it to whatever Oh, okay. Now, on one of the slides, and you'll be able to have this PowerPoint, you'll see that I did do, when I did it on a per acre basis, what was it? It was 125 It was about a $130, $130 per acre, okay. Rob, due to the due to the increase in the rotational grazing management. And so if they're wanting to compare cropland to a livestock operation, then you're going to have to do the full livestock operation and the full cropping cropping mm, assessment, yes. and, and then look at which one is a higher benefit. This one was only looking at the additional costs and the additional benefits due to the move to excellent rotational grazing. So those, those are two different questions. Yeah. Will so that answer your question, Rob? Yeah, I think so. It's not the happy answer, huh? Well, no, I was just wondering if they did do that in this, in the actual analysis that they did. No, th what they did was a partial budget. Yeah, it was like a net increase. Uh, due to the move to rotational grazing. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to point out uh, that uh, I see Todd's asked a question. I'll answer that for you. Yes, the, the PowerPoints are going to be available. Um, it, let me get the screen out of the way. And uh, so you can go to that uh, URL there, and uh, you'll be able to, uh, in, in a few days, uh, we won't have them there today, but uh, you'll be able to, to find our PowerPoints. You'll be able to um, download them. Uh, the, and the Excel workbook. And the Excel workbook. Um, so you, all that stuff will be available that we've added, uh, we scripted our slides so and we pretty much stuck to those and so uh, you'll be able to to see those slides but also obviously you can download the audio too and uh, and watch the whole thing just as it occurred today so yes people will be able to get those and and I was just reminded <laughs> that uh, those of you wanting CCA credits if you will click on the little uh, three sheets kind of in the upper right uh, on the live meeting toolbar uh, up here, uh, you'll see where you can download uh, that uh, handout and that sign-in sheet, and you'll send it to uh, Holly Kirkendall here at the East NTSC, and she'll be able to make sure you get CCA credit uh, for tuning in today. So uh, make sure you do that if you're interested in CCA credits. Okay, any other questions uh, online or? On phone. On phone. <laughs> Once again, for any questions or comments over the phone, please press star, then one, and record your name. Okay, I've got uh, one of the, well, I want to make a comment too. We had a person talk about not being able to hear us. I sure hope that that didn't happen to everybody. Um, but, but why don't you uh, email us here at the ENTSC if for some reason you couldn't hear that, and we'll, we'll make sure uh, that you have all the information you need to be able to download this uh, later. We're, we're, we're sure sorry about that. The, we, di we did it like we normally do, and normally everybody's able to hear, so hopefully it wasn't a problem on our end. Uh, but I did get another online question. Uh, Rob Michael ARS in Nebraska compares big blue grazing to dry land corn on partial budgets. Do you have any comments about that, Madeline? No. Okay. Uh, Though it's good information for Pennsylvania. Um, okay. Any other, uh, I'll, I'll look here to see if there's any other online. We do have a question that came in over the audio as well. Great. Right. Our question comes from a participant who is unable to record their name. If you press star zero, your line is open. Your line is open. Hi. I was just wondering what the cost involved with converting from the poor grazing management system to the better grazing management system. 
what the costs were for converting. Right, and how if it was still economical for a rancher to go and what he would have to do to go from a, a poor site to the excellent site. Well, we did have some estimates there for improving the pasture. Okay. And so what you'll see there, I think the thing that's valuable there is the kinds of things that we identified, some from Virginia and some that we thought about too. So that thinking framework could be helpful to you. So it involved things like soil testing. It involved things like applying nutrients and other soil amendments for adjusting pH. It involved seed and the, the, imp, uh, the application of the seed. Yeah, we, and, and in the uh, complete uh, workbook that Madeline's going to have available, you can see all the details. Uh, we just mentioned the highlights on fence and water. Uh, you can see all the details of those costs. Right, and so you'll see the number of units and the unit cost and things like that. And we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the numbers because we understand, you know, prices change very quickly. And the other thing is prices have regional variation. So that's why we really didn't talk a lot about numbers. We were really talking about the thinking process here. How do you set up the thinking so that you can tackle the question of, well, should I go to an enhanced grazing rotation and in better pasture, is it a good idea to do that? How do we think about that to help a decision maker really identify the alternatives and identify the benefits and costs of each alternative? Another thing I wanted to point out, um, and it's kind of hard for those of us in NRCF to get our head around sometimes, there was no cost share you noticed in this example. That this this was just real world. I want to make a change, not getting an equip contract. None of that. What what were the costs for a livestock manager in this situation to make those changes? So they still saw benefits uh, without any cost share, and so um, that's that's pretty strong too. We felt mm -hmm. uh, for for this situation. And, and we plan on doing that. To, if we have enough requests for a series, we, we plan on doing that in, in all the rest of them. Is uh, not even talk about cost share because uh, we're, we're thinking we're going to find out, just like this example, that it, it's positive without any cost share. And so then, uh, you know, somebody is involved in a contract, obviously that's icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, probably in most cases isn't needed. And in this case, we're talking about, you know, beef cow-calf operation too, which is uh, typically the lowest profit margin of all the livestock enterprises, nothing like dairy uh, or some of the others. So uh, just wanted to point that out. And another thing to point out, I would say, is that the values we're using were average annual values. The downside of those kinds of numbers is that they don't tell you about cash flow. So cash flow is the ability to pay your bills. So when that fence is installed and those watering facilities are installed, you're going to have to pay for them somehow. Either you've got money in the bank or you've made a loan. So average annual value is a limited use. It was helpful to us to highlight what the relative costs and the relative benefits were, but it doesn't handle the cash flow issue. And that could be another part of the future theory. It sure could. Uh, we, one of the questions, we had another online question come in, and I'm just going to demonstrate, I hope everybody can still see my cursor, uh, how you get the CCA credits. You click on this, the looks like little three sheets of paper right together up here. I'm going to click on that, and then up pops this box, uh, Documentation for Certified Profit Advisors. And then all I have to do is, is uh, check that, at, or highlight it, and click on Upload, and it should upload to your computer. Uh, if, if anybody has any problems with that, let us know, and we'll, we'll make sure we get it to you. But it, it should work real well. It has in the past. Okay, any, any more questions?
I have no further questions in queue at this time. I don't uh, see any more online either. You wrap it up. Um, well, we sure thank everybody. Uh, we uh, we really want your feedback. Um, those of you that know me and those that don't know me, uh, you can you can definitely email Madeline and I here at the ENTSC, and uh, we we want to know how to improve these. We we took on a big uh, topic here. I thought it was. Um, for us, we've never done anything like this before, and we'd like to continue it. So please give us your feedback. Uh, we want to be a, of a help to you, and uh, we, we're sure glad that you tuned in today. And again, if you have any problems with, with the downloading in the future of this presentation or any of the information, uh, why let us know, and uh, we'll make sure we get it to you. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, and don't forget about next month, Energy conservation practices will be our topic for the July seminar. Thanks a lot, everybody. And thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for participating in today's call. You may disconnect at this time. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome, sir. Have a good day. You too.